Welcome to Exploring Digital with Per, a podcast for entrepreneurs and CEOs who want their businesses to benefit from a digital first approach. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Exploring Digital with Per. I'm joined today by Farzana Badwell, who's the founder and CEO of Curzon PR. Hi, Farzana. Hello. Thanks for joining. So uh, do you want to kick us off by explaining a little bit about Curzon PR and uh, you know the history of the business? So we've been running for about 10 years. And, um, and in those 10 years, we've developed a niche area. So we focus predominantly on strategy. And uh, so we're more like a management consulting firm focusing on brand marketing, public relations. We tend to work a lot with emerging markets, um, mainly governments and corporates. So a lot of work in, in Asia and Middle East. And um, what's wonderful about the work that we do is we do a lot of capacity building. So we actually work um, actually hand in hand with our clients in building in-house capacity as well as helping them navigate uh, which agencies and consultants to bring on board uh, for them to reach their, um, their objectives. So it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite um, interesting from a PR marketing perspective because we're not just the external agency to be squeezed. Uh, they tend to see us very much as part of their in-house team. And is that uh, working, so you're working with lots of Far East and Asian clients, but is that with a, a global audience in mind or about bringing those 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 companies and bodies into a, a Western market? So it varies. So for instance, in, um, so for instance in, uh, in India, we work with a lot of their blue chip corporates that tend to be their largest, you know, um, player in certain verticals, and they tend to be quite cash rich. So they are on a bit of an acquisition spree. So they go around the world and they buy different sort of um, mainly Western brands. And so we tend to work with them a lot in terms of integrating those Western brands uh, into their sort of head, um, their corporate um, portfolio. Um, so there's a lot of cultural communications that we work with. Um, and we tend to work very much at the nexus of developed markets and emerging and frontier markets. So a lot of cultural communication and integration of different cultures um, and creating a sort of unified global corporate voice that uh, will speak and resonate to all different cultures. So at the moment, we're doing a lot of internal comms uh, for our clients, obviously because of what's happened with COVID. I guess as a as quite a strategic focused company, that's, it puts you in an interesting situation because often M&A deals uh, can be quite private and secretive and you, you, as much as you might have a strategy in place, you might have to be quite reactive sometimes with some of the, these, these brands and it's, oh, and now we've got this new acquisition and we're, and we're now ready to talk about it. So how, how, do you often find that it's, um, it's, you know, it's a race to kind of keep up with some of these, these buying sprees or is there always a, a clear strategy that you, you're able to kind of roll out each time a brand adds another a business? Well, you know, one of my sort of main um, campaigns uh, is really to try and get clients uh, and trying to sort of get them to understand to invite the PRs um, and the communication specialists at the beginning, because often in the past, um, they would only invite us right at the end to just knock out the press release. Um, yeah. And so and so what we're trying to get our clients to understand, and you know, they have been, uh, um, is to really get us in as early as possible um, because you know we identify perception issues we also need lead times in order to, to work on um, on issues we need to do sort of sentiment analysis um, in the company that is going to be acquired as well as existing um, and of, and a lot of it is actually fundamentally psychology uh, when one company buys another there's a lot of fear there's a lot of uncertainty um, and there needs to be a level of reassurance and integration required and actually you know a lot of acquisitions actually go pear shaped uh, and a lot of it is just down to you know poor communication Communications and lack of strategic planning. Yeah. So In internal um, and external. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so have you have you managed to get it to a stage then where some of your clients are making decisions about M and A uh, moves on the basis of the PR angle? Well, generally, what happens is um, is they. I tend to work a lot with the CEOs as well as obviously the um, CCOs, and um, and I also advise. The, the board and so what we tend to do is we tend to do a we tend to sort of bring it under the um, issues management umbrella so we identify it as an issue we do a risk assessment we then uh, do in, we put in contingency plans about what you know what could happen and how we're going to deal with it so that the companies are not reactive um, but are actually proactive and I find that actually companies increasingly are are much more um, proactive and willing to listen at the beginning uh, rather than call their PRs when there's a full-blown crisis and there's very little that we can actually achieve and do for them. 
Absolutely. And it's, I guess you're in a, well, Curzon are in a similar boat to, to Per, and it's trying to ensure that you're not just talking to the marketing department, but you're the, the, the PR you know, advisor at a board level. Not so that, you know, although we're a development company, we're not just helping out the IT or the, the marketing team, that, that we get a little bit more than 24 hours notice before a big M&A deal is announced and there's going to be a ton of traffic to a certain site. So um, just improving the quality of those conversations and, and helping businesses to understand that you know, these stakeholders do need to be involved really early on. Um, it's, it's good to hear that you know, someone else is fighting that battle. Yeah, but it's difficult. I mean, it's usually what I find is the first couple of years of working with a client, they just don't give you the time of day. Uh, they just, you know, um, they just see you as a tactical resource. And it's really our long-term clients that we've been working with them for a number of years that you build yeah. trust. Um, you know, and I often do that annoying thing like I told you so. You should have listened to me. And uh, yeah. and then when it goes pear-shaped, and then, and then they're sort of like, okay, actually, let's bring her in at the early part of the conversation. But it is a battle. And I think as agencies, we have to be a bit pushy. Um, and, you know, and sort of, you know, because sometimes actually they don't even know about the value we can add other than just the tactical execution. And, and they often think that agencies aren't really the place to go for strategy. They tend to just, you know, give the strategy. Internalize, yeah. Yeah, or they, or they tend to give it to, you know, they do the risk analysis with the lawyers or, um, you know, the management consultancies and so forth. But if it's a communications piece, you know, we should really be, um, we should really be there having the initial conversations with them. So historically, have you tended to, I mean, you know, working with lots of international clients, have you done a lot of business face to face? Are you are you jumping on a plane every week, or have you, uh, you know, spent the last few years on Zoom calls anyway? Uh, no, actually, I have um, I have been constantly traveling. Sometimes I take eight flights in ten days. Um, mm. The only upside to that is really um, my sort of uh, BA points uh, that I can then use. <laughs> Uh, but then, at, you know, at the end of the day, the last thing you want to do is then travel again. Um, it is utterly exhausting traveling for business. It's not something that I particularly enjoy. It's something I do because um, the nature of my sort of client base is international and they quite like that sort of, you know, in-person meeting. And um, in order to build trust, but I often find that if you have clients for, you know, for a number of years, uh, the face-to-face -face requirement starts reducing um, because yeah. by then there's been a trust establishment. Uh, and I'm hoping with this COVID um, sort of pandemic, it's kind of taught people that it is okay to conduct business um, you know, through Zoom channels. It's much kinder to the environment. It reduces our carbon footprint. It's better for our work-life balance. You know, it's better. I'm a mother as well. So it's, you know, it's better for me not to spend too much time away from my children. Um, of and course, so, yeah. Yeah. So I'm guessing at the start of this outbreak, you know, working with a, a number of Far East clients, you were seeing other markets being affected before, you know, Western Europe was. Um, and yeah. so travel was already dropping off. Um, I, I guess, how did, uh, how quickly did you see an impact? What were the first things you had to react to? Um, and and you know, was, uh, were your clients happy to swap to just running it over Slack or Zoom calls and things like that? Um, it, it was a variety. I mean, we've got a number of um, of manufacturing clients with plants around the world um, with very complex supply chains. Um, so we started seeing supply and, and obviously um, you have uh, in China is very much you know, the center for, um, especially Wuhan, the center for automotive um, supply mm -hmm. chain parts. And so some of our automotive clients had initial problems as soon as it kicked off in Wuhan because they couldn't get their supplies uh, and the supply chain was interrupted and so what's now happened with these companies that they started to think very strategically about having parallel supply chains so they're not over reliant upon one region and not just um, moving all their supply chains based upon cost but doing a bit of a sort of diversification of risk by having some supply chains in Europe um, as well as in um, as well as in China and obviously thinking about India as an alternative to China so you're seeing um, a very different sort of approach to supply chain management as well as sort of more agility as well and the ability for these plants to um, to respond but it's been quite sad actually how some sectors have been hit really bad yeah of course uh, uh, yeah and uh i mean automotive an interesting one in that yes you know, immediately the the inclination is to well how can we ramp up our supply chain how can we reduce our dependence and then not being able to anticipate that maybe two two months later you're not selling any cars at all, um, and and be, being able to to you know forecast for all of these scenarios is is next to, next to impossible, which you do sympathise with. So, so you saw uh, you know changes to how clients were working and and you know, supply chain being one aspect of it. 
Um, what about the communication side? How did you manage to to change, I don't know, your account management or your new business processes to allow for the fact that you weren't going to be seeing these people face to face? Well, actually, I mean, the internal team, we've been used to working remotely for about a year and a half prior to mm-hmm. um to, to lockdown measures. So we were used to it. And because our clients are abroad, uh, you know, we were all used to working, you know, by email, Slack, um, and you know, various other different tools. Um, so it wasn't so much of an issue. I think the biggest issue was a lot of our large clients having to communicate with their um, their employees who are used to coming in sort of nine to six and you know, and that's how the sort of culture is maintained. And so it was how could they sort of keep um, a sense of cohesion around the employees working from home um, and, you know, and sort of boost their morale. And um, so I thought that was actually quite interesting. And we did that by working with various CEOs and creating video content um, mm-hmm. and, and also trying to get the CEOs to, to show a bit more of their vulnerable side, their human side, um, how they are also you know, struggling and dealing with the lockdown. And it was really quite interesting how communications did shift and pivot to becoming more empathy led um, more sort of um, more vulnerable in a way, and yeah. um, and I thought that was quite interesting. I, I guess to to me and to lots of the the audience, uh, seeing you know content from British companies on LinkedIn, it's almost second nature that or you know it's it's what you've come to expect now that people are showing a more personal side or uh, more vulnerability whereas i guess with a lot of your clients perhaps more conservative more traditional ways of doing business it's a bigger step change for them a, a huge step change because um you know often in in certain cultures um it is quite differential and um and also quite hierarchical and very different sort of cultures um you know than sort of western europe and, and north america and so where you know the age of difference is over and um and so they they very much sort of you know did adapt and in terms of the frequency of communications also increased with employees so where as a ceo would do a quarterly town hall meeting they would now do them once every two weeks um and you know and also there's a lot more sort of engagement with you know surveys being sent to employees in terms of what their main concerns are what kind of information they want to hear about um so there's a lot more listening and it was a lot more audience led which i think you know is is positive yeah, completely. Yeah. So has your focus as a result changed, um, you know, with, with, the, with a downturn, with a, with a recession that is coming globally? Do you think a lot of your focus will change to be more internal PR focused? Well, I think definitely um, internal communications has massively ramped up. So we were hardly doing any internal communications for our clients. And then as soon as the pandemic hit, a lot of the focus went from external comms to mm. internal comms. And uh, in terms of communicating to the employees um, and also complex when you have a multinational uh, client and they've got different operations in different jurisdictions which have different government measures and they're at different parts of the curve of, of you know of COVID um, and so it's like how to communicate to this global community of employees um, when there's different measures being impacted to them in different ways um, and also how to keep them motivated with some you know mental health issues um, and they were um, and you know people struggling caring for young children as well as work working um and so it was you know it was incredibly tough i think people around the world have really struggled during this pandemic and you know what's been nice that's come out of it is there has been a sense of uh community that i've seen you know from our clients and the way they have conversed with with their teams absolutely and, and i think Long, longer term, you know, the, the 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 gain or the damage you can do to your your brand at this time isn't necessarily yeah. about you know what you're what you're publicly saying about your company. It's what you will be remembered for how how you treated your employees or how many people you furloughed yeah. and then let go. Um, you know, in the same way that uh, I think those people, companies are feeling pressure on them to to be able to you know behave ethically and to you know to be seen as um, working in a, in a compassionate way. In the same way that. CEOs seem uh, got a, pr- a lot of pressure on them to be responding you know, to Black Lives Matter or whatever the, the issue of the day is to be able to say you know we we are um, you know we are mindful of these issues and, and that matters more now than talking about just what it is that you do. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I completely agree. It's it's and you really see leadership actually during these times. I mean, even if you look at political leadership, uh, we work with actually a lot of governments. Um, so I find it always fascinating watching how people lead. And you, know, and you look at the New Zealanders prime minister, um, Jacinda Hearn, and how she has really been celebrated for her communication style because it has been very empathy led. It's been very informal where she does, you know, Facebook live feeds, sitting on her sofa, after putting the kids down. Um, and kind of that's kind of what people want. They, in the absence of 
um, being able to physically connect with humans, people want that connection. And that can be delivered through, through video, through podcasts, through you know, Facebook Live. And you want to see a bit of informality. You don't want to see stiff politicians um, you know, in a sort of stiff press conference. You want to see someone that you, you know, you'd have a drink with down the pub that you trust and mm. who's just telling you as it is. And, do, you um, think it, do you think it's here to stay? Is it, is it here forever? I think we're definitely moving into an age of empathy-led communications. Um, and I think that whether it's here to stay, I don't know, because actually you know, our societies are, consistent, are, are always evolving and changing. But the current sort of zeitgeist is very much empathy-led um, and also to be a bit more real in the sense of not just pretending you're some sort of superhero politician or CEO, but you know, saying a few times, you know what, I screwed up and I intend to rectify it. So being a bit more vulnerable about your own sort of limitations, um, I think you know, people have pretty much realized that we are all human and what people really want is, can I trust that person? Is that person gonna be honest with me? Yes, completely. Uh, yeah. And uh, so if that, if that is the environment we're operating in it, where uh, there's this zeitgeist trend, as, as, as you said, of, of empathetic-led communications, um, but that may change and it, and it could alter with the nature of lockdown or second waves of infection and all of these things. In, a, in an environment where it's almost impossible to predict three months ahead, how do you, as a strategically focused comms agency, how do you advise people longer term? What can you... Uh, you know, are you are you able to to think as long term as you were? Yeah, I mean, what we do, what, what we advise our clients is, you know, we sort of talk to them about the black swan theory uh, that you know is based upon a book that came out um, a few years back, and it talked about how because we're becoming more interconnected, more globalized, it means that um, a crisis in one country will completely, you know actually start growing and become you know, a pandemic and not a pandemic just in terms of viruses, but pandemic in terms of social justice movements and so forth. And um, so what that basically means is that crisis is here to stay um, and it's only going to accelerate. And, um, and you know, with this pandemic that we have with COVID, there is an uncertainty in terms of immuni immunity and sort of herd immunity. And so there are lots of talks about, well, what if it comes, of, comes back towards the end of the year? If it's this is an element of seasonality. So in the Northern Hemisphere, there's countries that are going to become incredibly um, sort of cooler and does the temperature affect the virus? So therefore, are we looking at perhaps it coming back in October, November? And then it's going to be even more confusing because you're going to have normal people with just the flu, but they're not going to know if it's the flu or COVID. And God knows what's happening about the testing, you know, when our government sorts itself out, who knows? Um, and so we don't really have that certainty. So our strategy with clients tends to be based upon agility the ability to be agile and, um, and to be able to take a lot of feedback in so that they can pivot quite quickly and be responsive. You completely. You mentioned earlier, uh, you know, just into her hern having done a fantastic job of communicating during this crisis and perhaps our own government, you know, with the testing in particular, not having done a particularly good job in communicating. I know that uh, in the past you've, you've done some work in, in the political sphere in the UK with the Conservative Party. Um, what would what would have been your recommendation to them in terms of how they should have communicated better throughout this? I think I think it was difficult for them because I mean I think it was difficult for the UK because um, a lot of these other countries that have experienced SARS and um, and other um, you know other viruses they were more equipped psychologically and in terms of their infrastructure to react. I think it looks like, and of course there's going to be a review in due case, but it looks like we were too slack, that we acted quite slow, um, that we should have locked down the um, airports. I think what particularly um, upsets me is we didn't protect the most vulnerable people in our society. Um, I think what happened with the care homes, you know, we were very slow in response to that. And, you know, and it, and it saddens me because, you know, it's during these times that it really shows a a lens on what our society is. And if we can't protect our most vulnerable, what does that say about our values? And so, yeah, um, yeah so I think we're, we're gonna have a lot of lessons to be learned uh, in June course when everyone's gonna dissect what happened. Um, and there'll be probably a bit of soul searching and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to handle but, I mean, it in a more- But do you, do you think uh, the British government has shown enough empathy in the way they communicate or are there, is it, you know, is there a variety in, in terms of approaches, you know, different see, people seem to get it better than others? Well, I think, Has you it know, been clear enough? 
I think what's been quite tough um, has been the Dominic Cummings issue, um, where, you know, he came up with a whole plethora of excuses. And, you know, I think the worst thing is, as a communicator, is assuming that your audience is dumb, because they're not. And I think that's the worst thing you can do in if you're in a position of power is um, underestimate your audience. And um, and I think that that loss of trust, I think, is really quite sad. Um, and I think it's not just going to affect the Conservative Party, but it's going to affect government. It's going to affect, you know, authority, uh, the fabric of our society. You know, you had that. Um, I think if if somebody is part of making the rules and then they break the rules and then they come up with all sorts of, you know, whoppers uh, to cover it. Yeah, and then they don't stand down. It's, you know, it's just not, it's just not on. And I think the British, they believe in fair play. And, well, it's um, almost like American politics. So. <laughs> not, I mean, really where, do you, where do you start? <laughs> I think we probably avoid it in, in entirety. It'll be easier. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to touch on, uh, I know you do a lot of work with, with entrepreneurs through uh, Oxford Foundry uh, across a, a really wide variety of, uh, of industries. And I, I just wanted to get a feel of how you felt the, the UK and wider startup scene had been affected, whether that was through um, you know, lack of access to uh, talent or funding um, or you know, uptake. You know, what have you seen across, across the, the businesses you're working with? So with the startups um, at the foundries, I mean, they are so innovative and um and i think you know they they have really responded in such a in, incredible way a lot of them were in the phase of raising finance from investors so they ended up doing their sort of um investor decks and videos and uh, and then they just jumped onto zoom and obviously with this generation a lot of them are in their 20s it's just like breathing i mean you know perhaps my generation that you know we have a slight freak out their generation is just like oh yeah just, just get on the video call, just you know, do a WhatsApp. I mean, you know, they don't see what the fuss is about. And um, so they, they're incredibly inspiring, actually, this generation. I think they're probably Generation Z. Um, and they just get on with it. And they're very purposeful, very different from my generation. I mean, I was brought up in sort of, you know, sort of Thatcher's generation, where it's just about, you know, work hard, make money. Whereas these guys are very much about profit, fine, but we also care about the planet and people. And so I'm blown away. And a lot of them have actually repurposed their resources and their businesses in order to help without any you know, thoughts of getting profit back um, or mm. milking it as a PR exercise. Genuinely, you know, they look at their business and they're like, how can we help? You know, how can we help the NHS? How can we help the vulnerable members of our society? Um, they are just, they're just, I mean, I have hope for our society when I work with these people. They're, they're inspiring. I think they're, they're better than my generation, for sure. And, and hopefully they're, they're leading the trend and, and setting the standard for, that other companies are, are trying to follow. Yeah, so yeah. Um, out of interest, with the ones who were going for funding, um, has you know, have investors been as, as happy to back new ideas? Because, I mean, various startups we've spoken to, it's been a case of maybe investors were more happy at the beginning to, uh, to, to put money in to, to support invest, uh, existing investments rather than to, to back new ideas for the time being. Well, I see some investors have put the investments on hold. They have a wait and see approach. Um, other investors, if the idea or if, you know, if some of these startups I've seen have slightly pivoted their business to take advantage of trends that have been accelerated by the pandemic. Um, and so those ones are getting investments because, you know, there are opportunities in times of crisis. Um, of and so some of them have adapted their investor decks um, so that it is um, it has a bit of a, a sort of post COVID lens on it. And so they have tended to do better. Okay, really interesting. And then, uh, so so funding's not been uh, an issue if you've been able to pivot your business, um, but another investors have held off. Do you, do you have any insight into how long you think it might slow down? I think it depends on, on the um, on the specific business. Uh, so, for instance, one of our startups they do telemedicine, and that's just gone. Pew. You know, mm. um, that's done really well because then people have realized that actually 
previously investors were thinking, well, it'll probably take about 10 years for there to be a behavioral shift. But now, um, because of COVID, that behavioral shift has just reduced, you know, it's, it's taken a month for, for that behavioral change to actually take effect where people actually are now happy to speak to health professionals, um, you know, through Skype or, you know, um, or, or Zoom or, or whatever. So it's really individual to the business. Um, but investors who have liquid, you know, who have liquidity, are looking for opportunities, and I think you know it depends upon their risk profile. But there is a number of investors who have made a lot of money time and time again during times of crisis, be it recession, be it pandemic, be it political turmoil. Um, there is definitely a segment of investors that look for opportunities during these times, and they keep their investment war chest specifically for these times, be it buying distressed properties, um, you know, or whatever. And actually, if you look at the stock market, there are um, you know. There are investors that are actively investing and the stock market is growing in certain sectors. Just look at, you know, the prices of Amazon, Zoom. Mm. And about, there's probably going to yeah. be probably going to be plenty of uh, merger and acquisition activity as well to keep you busy for the, for the next year, as yeah. I guess. But even I personally, I invested, you know, when the airline stocks tanked, I invested in mm. them. And now they've, you know, they've gone up in the space yeah. of a week. So there's opportunity in crisis. You just have to not panic uh, and be fear driven and just be really clear about what actually what is a permanent change, what is a temporary change, what is an accelerated trend, um, and then tr take a sort of a macro approach to how yeah. society will develop post. Do you, th do you think the, the, the Gen Z entrepreneurs have panicked more or less than the, the, the older generations? I think they're amazing. I, I think that they have panicked less. Um, I mean, I, I remember I set up my business um, just after the recession. Uh, mm. Stupid idea in hindsight, but um, I and I remember, I remember that uh, I mean, it's me personally. I remember when I was much younger, I would, I would have more of an appetite for risk, and I would just go and do things, and I would kind of do fast and think later. Um, yeah. And now, as I'm older, I'm in my forties. I'm very sort of like almost analysis paralysis and I sometimes have really good ideas and then I'm so scared because I talk myself out of it and I see someone else has done it five years down the line and it's a great idea and I kick myself so I think perhaps as we get older we perhaps become a little bit adverse to risk whereas I think this younger generation they have you know they they can they're more they can be more resilient they get up they go they fall down and they also feel no shame in failure which is mm. wonderful you know I thought so, so when so when you're advising a startup like this on on comms, for example, uh, and they they might be so quick to do something and, and have to worry about the comms later, I mean, are you able to to sort of implement or instill any of these ideals of of long term thinking or, or strategic led or you know uh, how well received from a PR angle something might be into their decision making? So originally, I used to always say to clients, be it the students that I mentor at the entrepreneurship, um, entrepreneurship center or my, um, my PR clients, I used to always, you know, talk about long-term planning, long-term strategies. Um, and actually what's happened uh, recently is because things move so quickly, um, not just because of COVID, but, you know, price that because communication is so rapid. Um, it's much more about agility. And so it's just about creating awareness. Um, in entrepreneurs and C-suite executives and political leaders of the impact of their actions uh, and, and the importance of getting the messaging right um, and, um, and the optics. Uh, and, and what that really means is to become a bit more emotionally aware and not just see things from your own sort of narrow tunnel, but to be able to have a wider perspective, which is why diversity is so important, because if you can sort of, if you have an idea of, or a course of action, and you have a diverse team, you will actually get 360 degrees on potential perceptions that will ripple out in society. Um, so, you know, so I try and you know, say, get away from doing the 100 page strategy plans that we used to do um, into creating more a sort of strategic mindset um, and an understanding of perceptions and having a very, very strong comms measurement um, in place with like a feedback loop for evaluation so that you can constantly pivot um, and you can respond to, to the public by being connected okay, to them. Yeah. Do you think, do you think the younger generation having grown up with technology and uh, 
being so used to inf- you know, information moving so quickly that um, the, the, almost the PR risk is lower, that they're less likely to make decisions that have a, a negative you know, public impact? I think that they, um, they perhaps, you know, I think they, the way they sort of view technology is not as an add-on, it's just essential to their life. Um, and I think that they, um, they are also more forgiving if they make a mistake or, you know, or say something and, you know, they, they sort of you know, are able to, you know, these YouTube influencers, you know, able to come up and say, well, you know what, I had that view last year, but I've actually moved on from it because I've learned more about it. And now this is what I believe. So they're much more flexible and adaptable and, uh, and much more open um, to being able to change and pivot their own beliefs, be it political or, you know, um, or so forth. So I think they are able to be more fluid. They're not as rigid as we are. You know, we would sort of distrust someone if they changed from left to right, you know, mm. uh, whereas I think for them, it's like it's part of their journey, you know, <laughs> um, but they, they're just, you know, I think they're more forgiving, they're kinder to themselves, you know, they're kinder to each other. Well, thank you, Fozana, so much for joining. Had a really fascinating chat with you and, and you know, best of luck to Kurz and, uh, and to all of your clients and, uh, and mentees. Brilliant. Thank you so much for having me on, Nick. Pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for joining another episode of Exploring Digital with Perth. See you again next time. Thanks for joining. Remember to subscribe and follow us and to share today's insights with other businesses you know who want to stay relevant in a digital first world.